Now, after two weeks, some sailors found him in the hold of that ship, and at this point, the ship was already well out to sea. So they grabbed him, brought him up to the captain. The captain asked him the question, what is your name, boy? And he immediately answered, my name is Richard King, and you can either throw me overboard or put me to work, but I'm not going back. And we continue here on Our American Stories, and our next story is about an American legend named Richard King. King's legacy can be seen on every tailgate and door of Ford's upscale F-Series trucks. The logo reads King Ranch. Here to tell the story of Richard King is Roger McGrath, author of Gunfighters, Highwaymen, and Vigilantes. A former U.S. Marine and former history professor at UCLA, Dr. McGrath has appeared on numerous History Channel documentaries, and is a regular contributor to Our American Stories. Here's Roger McGrath. The cattle kings of the Old West carved empires out of the wilderness. They were larger than life characters, bold, daring, intelligent, courageous, tough. They had great strength of character and iron wills. No cattle king exhibited these characteristics more than Richard King. Born in New York City to Irish immigrant parents in 1824, Richard King is only three years old when his parents die and he is left in the care of an aunt. At nine years old, he is apprenticed to a jeweler. The jeweler works him hard six days a week. On his day off, the young boy walks down to the docks of Manhattan and watches the ships come and go. He dreams of climbing aboard a ship and sailing off. At 12 years old, he does just that. Here's William Yancey, historian at Texas A&M University, Kingsville. He ran away to the docks in New York City, and he snuck on board an ocean-going ship called the Desdemona, and he hid out in the hold of that ship for about two weeks, just scrounging whatever food he could get his hands on. Now, after two weeks, some sailors found him in the hold of that ship, and at this point, the ship was already well out to sea. So they grabbed him, brought him up to the captain. The captain asked him the question, what is your name, boy? And he immediately answered, my name is Richard King, and you can either throw me overboard or put me to work, but I'm not going back. The captain seemed to be impressed by this young man's attitude, so he put him to work. For the next several years, King works in a variety of capacities on several different ships. He demonstrates such intelligence, talent, and leadership the two different ship captains school him in navigation in command of a ship. By the time he is 16, he has a pilot's license and knows the Gulf Coast and the rivers of the Cotton Kingdom like the back of his hand. In 1842, King enlists for service in the Seminole War in Florida. It is during his Seminole War service that he meets Mifflin Kennedy, another ship's officer. King and Kennedy will become lifelong friends. Kennedy had been born in Pennsylvania and like King, had first gone to sea as a cabin boy and worked his way up to become a ship's pilot. By 1843, Richard King has grown and matured. The 19-year-old is square-jawed, well-muscled, and tall for the times at 5 feet 11 inches. When provoked, he can turn the air purple with profanity. That makes his friendship with the soft-spoken Quaker, Mifflin Kennedy, something of a surprise. In 1847, Richard King enlists for a second war, taking command of the ship Colonel Cross and rises to rank of captain in the U.S. Navy during the Mexican War. King serves for the war's duration, transporting troops and supplies. He becomes intimately familiar with the Texas and Mexican coasts and with the Rio Grande River. It is during his service in the Mexican War that King recognizes steamship service would revolutionize the commerce of South Texas 
especially the Rio Grande Valley. When the war ends, he buys this ship he commands as war surplus and is often steaming. King soon forms a partnership with his old friend, Mifflin Kennedy. By the mid-1850s, their company is operating more than two dozen ships, and thanks in part to their low rates, they are monopolizing shipping on the Rio Grande River. They will continue in this preeminent position for more than two decades. Here again is William Yancey. In 1850, Captain King had been on a steamboat run to Rio Grande City and back. He had had a rough couple of days. He had had problems with his sailors. He had had problems with the engines on his steamboats. The final straw was when he got back to Brownsville. He went to moor his steamboat in the slip where he normally kept it, and somebody already had a boat there. Today, there was a steamboat in this slip. Now, everybody in Brownsville knew not to park their steamboats there because that was Richard King's slip, but today there's a steamboat there. Well, this sent him over the edge. He starts cursing a blue streak. Had to go down the river a little ways, found an empty slip to moor his boat, and he starts walking back towards this houseboat, and he's about to give the occupant of this houseboat a piece of his mind. Well, he never got a chance to do that. There was a young lady on the houseboat who had heard him, and she decided to confront him first. And the two walk towards each other, and this young lady says, essentially, who do you think you are using language like that? This is my father's houseboat. He has just as much right to be here as you do. Why don't you spend less time making a fool of yourself and more time washing your filthy boat? And at that, Richard King didn't really have a response. He's not someone who was left speechless very often, but this time he was left speechless. He turned around and he walked back to his boat. And then he and his sailors spent the rest of the afternoon washing that boat. Over the next several days, he couldn't get this young lady out of his mind. So he's gonna to go to his best friend and business partner, Mifflin Kennedy. So he goes to Kennedy and asks him, who's the young lady whose father's houseboat's parked in my slip? And Kennedy says, well, that's Miss Henrietta Chamberlain. Her father's the new Presbyterian minister in town. Kennedy said, there's only one way you're going to get to meet her, and that's if you start going to church with her. Well, over the next several weeks and months, he becomes a very faithful Presbyterian. He um, is there every time the doors of the church are open. And to make a long story short, he'll begin a four-year courtship of Miss Henrietta. But eventually, the two of them will be married in 1854 there in Brownsville. Uh, her father performed the ceremony. The ceremony was at their church.